with um, only those who are present. So late comers can um, just watch the video. Let me stop the transcription and then mute everyone. So before I start, I am hoping you can hear my voice loudly. Yes, sir. Okay, good. I also hope you can see the slides. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's fine. So let's move. Yeah, so today we are looking at types of discourses, types of discourses. Um, in our last... So in our last class, we had ended by discussing problems with definitions. We had seen various ways in which definitions could be problematic. Today, we, look, we want to look at types of discourses and what is a discourse. Sometimes when we write, we put individual sentences together for different purposes. A collection of sentences is called a passage or discourse. Uh, so a discourse is also called a passage. So basically, when you are looking at a collection of sentences, you are looking at a discourse or a passage. Now we shall distinguish passages and arguments and those that are not. So the, the bottom line of this exercise is to distinguish argumentative passages from those that are not. You know, since we are in the business of argumentation, you know, we are focusing most of our early, early energies now to singling out things that are not argumentative, you know, and placing them in the categories where they belong, because that is also essential in the business of uh, critical thinking. Argument. A discourse is called an argument. If it contains a claim or conclusion that is supported with reasons or information. Uh, so if there's a claim, which is also technically a conclusion, conclusion and claim are technically the same. If there's any of those, and it is supported with reasons or information, then that's an argument. Those are the two components of an argument. An argument contains at least two items, a conclusion, which could also be a claim or decision, and then expressions aimed at providing support or proof for the conclusion, claim or decision. So conclusion, claim, decision are all the same. They all pass through the same process. They, they need to be supported with reasons, information, or premises. So technically speaking, they, are, they constitute the same sort of end in the argumentative process. Example of argument. Ghanaian men think women don't deserve to occupy high positions. They question the competence and qualification of women who are sent to high office, but refrain from doing the same to even incompetent men. Okay. Therefore, Ghanaian men do not respect women. Now, if you look at these three sentences or statements, you notice that the third one is a conclusion. And then the first two are reasons being provided for the conclusion. So statements one and two are serving as information, evidence, or reasons to support statement three. For attempting to support statement three, these statements are called premises. Statement three, which is being supported, is called conclusion. So that's technically an argument. Now, identifying arguments. The first thing is to learn to identify an argument. 
Now, in identifying arguments, there are certain basic things we need to watch out for. Um, yeah, give me a few seconds. Let me get something. Okay, so we are talking about identifying arguments. The first thing in identifying arguments is that there are certain words or phrases that immediately show you you are looking at an argument. There are, in, there are two types. We have premise indicators. We have those that tell you you are looking at a premise. And then we have those that tell you you are looking at a conclusion. Now, the ones that tell you you are looking at a premise, we call them premise indicators. When you see these words or phrases, you know you are looking at a premise. If, if you see them in a sentence, especially at the beginning of a sentence, then such a sentence is a premise. Okay, so the, the following words, for, when you see for at the beginning of a sentence, then it means that the statement or the sentence is being given as a reason for something else. For, granted that, in view of the fact that, as much in as much as, since it is a fact that one cannot doubt that, you know, because now this one is most explicit. The reason is that, the reason is that. So that's the most explicit of them, as shown by the fact that these are premise indicators. Uh, they tell you you are looking at a premise, and then you have the conclusion indicators. Have therefore, consequently, hence, asserting that for this reason, these are, you know, these tell you you are looking at a conclusion. But you must not see these things in an argument. In fact, most arguments don't contain them. You know, they, they are just used for emphasis. They are not, they are not necessary. They are not necessary in sentences that compose arguments. You know. it's, it's, uh, it's only when people feel like that they, are, they add them. You know. So you need to learn to identify arguments without these indicators. And of course, you wouldn't expect to see indicators in your examination. You know. Then we have non-arguments. Not every passage or cluster of propositions is an argument. Some passages are non-argument, including narratives, instructional passages, rhetorical polemic, or opinion. OK. So we'll begin with narrative. A narrative is a passage that reports a sequence of events according to the order the events occurred. You know, a passage rep reporting a sequence of events according to the order they occurred. So, example, over the course of two weeks, some police officers have been observed stopping and checking cars in the area between Sawam and Aninam on the Accra Kumasi Road. They extort money and abuse motorists who question the authority, brandishing AK-47 assault rifles and dressed in heavy police gear. These officers do not just check cars, they also assault some motorists and passengers. So this is a narrative. It's a collection of factual statements, you know, according to a certain order. So it's like a story. That's a narrative. Then you see instructional passage. Instructional passage is a passage that describes a process or sequence of things to do in a specific order. You know, a process of sequence or sequence of things to do in a specific order. So it's Technically, 
a collection of imperatives. It offers a list of directives to follow to accomplish some desired effects. The example below offers a list of directives on how to use a fire extinguisher. Example, pull the pin, aim the nozzle at the base of the fire. Aiming at the top of the flame with a extinguisher won't be effective. In a controlled manner, squeeze the trigger to release the agent. Sweep the nozzle from side to side until the fire is put out. So this is an instructional passage, a collection of imperatives or imperative sentences in a certain order. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> then we have rhetorical polemic. <clears throat> this is a passage <clears throat> communicating a usually strong feeling and persuasively vents an opinion. Example, I hate these lab tests. <coughs> I hate these lab tests. That's an emotive expression. Every time I'm exposed to disease plants, I fall ill. <coughs> now that's a claim. I'm sure they hate me or they're punishing me. <coughs> that's an emotive expression. It's disgusting how I get sick too often, emotive expression. So you have about four emotive expressions, including a claim. <clears throat> so basically, rhetorical polemic is a collection of emotive expressions. A passage that communicates, you know, feeling. And that, you know, it's composed of emotive expressions and could contain a claim, could include a claim or claims, you know. So that's a rhetorical polemic. Now you can see it is different from an argument. An argument contains a conclusion or claim supported by premises, but rhetorical polemic contains emotive expressions which could include a claim or claims. You know, so there, there, there could be claims in both arguments and rhetorical polemic, but in argument, the claim is supported. In rhetorical polemic, it is not supported. It's just accompanied by emotive expressions. A little exercise. <clears throat> Name four types of discourses studied in this chapter. Four types of discourses. So anyone? <clears throat> before I answer them myself. Four types of discourses. So four types of discourses. Argument, narrative, instructional passage, rhetorical polemic. What is an argument? An argument it's a passage communicating uh, containing a conclusion or claim supported with reasons, information, or evidence. List the components of an argument. Components of an argument are conclusion or claim and premises, supporting premises. Distinguish between argument and rhetorical polemic. An argument is a passage containing a claim or conclusion supported with reasons, information, or evidence. <clears throat> a rhetorical polemic is a passage communicating, um, containing rhetorical, um, you know, sorry, emotive expressions and could include a claim or claims accompanying those emotive expressions. Now that's it about types okay. of discourses. Yes. Um, so you said arguments consist of claims and premises, but we learned that premises are the same as claims. No, premises are not claims. Okay, so premises are reasons given for claims, you know, 
Now, one claim could support another, but the supporting claim would be called a premise. You know, so the 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 conclusion, which is a claim, you know, it, the the conclusion is usually a claim, and then the premises, uh, you know, uh, supporting reasons, evidence or information. Of course, they could appear as claims, uh, but they are technically called premises, while the one that serves as conclusion is called conclusion. You know, so yeah, when you see claims as either a conclusion or a premise, then you, you should know whether the claim is a premise or a conclusion. Now, if you look at the example of the argument we saw, you can see that uh, statements one and two could also be claims. But when you look at the three statements, then you see that they are supporting another claim, which is a conclusion. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So now we are looking at disagreements or disputes in the business of critical thinking. Uh, argumentation is a, a very central. Well, not let's not say central. It's not the it's not the central focus of critical thinking, but it is one of the major, uh, uh, you know, points. Is one of the major areas where critical thinking plays a role, you know. <clears throat> okay, so we are training you guys to use critical thinking in your entrepreneurial research activities uh, and decision making, you know. And then those who are going into the legal profession to use critical thinking in their arguments and argumentative reasoning. So uh, argumentation is not the central, it's not the center of critical thinking, but it's a prominent rule. Another major focus of critical thinking is other kinds of reasoning. Reasoning applied to other activities, including administrative, entrepreneurial, academic, political, and all other activities, you know. Now, argument is uh, uh, a significant, category of activities where critical thinking is needed. And when you come to argument, you talk about uh, disagreements play a critical role in argument. And when you talk about disagreements, there are two kinds of disagreements. You have verbal disagreement, and then you have the substantive disagreement. So the verbal disagreement of dispute it's a disagreement about the meaning of a word or words. Disagreement about the meaning of a word or words. Example, that man is a fanti. No, he's not a fanti. He's an akan. So when someone disagrees that someone is a fanti because he thinks the person is an akan, then the person doesn't know that a fanti is an akan. So something is missing, that, 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 that someone doesn't understand the meaning of, the full meaning of fanti. When the person understands the full meaning of fanti, then this disagreement disappears. So we call it verbal disagreement, and logicians don't regard verbal disagreements as real disagreements. You know, they don't give us the status of real disagreements because they think that it 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 doesn't belong. It shouldn't be a disagreement. You know, so meanings need need to be sorted out. Now, second example: she is a Christian because she receives holy communion. No, she's not a Christian because she does not speak in tongues. You know, so someone is arguing that someone is a Christian because the person receives holy communion, and someone else thinks that. Holy Communion doesn't make someone a Christian. It is whether she speaks in tongues or not. And so the disagreement is about the, what it means to be a Christian. So if we could sort out the meaning of being a Christian, then this argument should not take place. You know? 
Now, this particular verbal dispute might be a little bit more challenging to resolve compared to the first example. You know, but it, it is still a verbal disagreement. Then we have the substantive disagreement or substantive dispute. So which logicians call real disagreement or real dispute. So the real dispute, you know, is the substantive disagreement about facts or values. Now, the substantive disagreement is disagreement over facts or values. So the actual, either a factual disagreement or a value disagreement. Now, example of factual disagreement. Accra is the capital of Ghana. No, Kumasi is the capital of Ghana. So that's a factual disagreement. You resolve it by verifying the facts, finding out what the facts are. You know, so this might not be a disagreement in Ghana because we know the capital of Ghana, but it might be a disagreement in China or Russia. Then example of value or disagreement over values. Accra should be the capital of Ghana. No, Accra should not be the capital of Ghana. So that one is a disagreement over people's preferences and values. Someone would prefer that Accra is the capital. Someone else would prefer that Accra is not the capital. And the preferences are usually based on value systems. Your preference is based on what you value or what you value more in comparison to something else, you know. So disagreements over values are, should be a bit more difficult to resolve compared to resolving factual disagreements because to resolve disagreements in values, you need to find out the values of those who are disagreeing. Because that will be the starting point in trying to see why they are differing, you know. Okay. Now, a little exercise. Determine whether the following disagreement is verbal or real. Sandra says, that man is quite old. He died at 50. And Comfort says, you call that old? He died young. Is it a verbal or a real disagreement? Anyone? Richard and uh, Lonesy. Um, sir, please, I think it's a verbal dispute. Okay, so why do you think it's a verbal dispute? Yeah, so explain, please, why it's verbal. <laughs> Unless you want oh. someone to, I want to, take to help you back. I want to take pillow. And I was hearing what you were saying. Pillow. Mm. Yeah. I've taken it though. Okay, so is there anyone who can explain explain why he or she thinks it's verbal? Hello, sir. Yes, go ahead. I think there is a disagreement between the word old. Disagreement about the word old. Yeah, about the word old. Okay, so <clears throat> the meaning of old is uh, not settled, or let's say what is entailed by old is not settled. So, and that is why there is a disagreement. So Sandra thinks, sorry. So Sandra thinks that old is 50, and Comfort thinks that old is 
more than 50. And that 50 should not be classified as old. You know? And so I think the disagreement is about what old entails. Just about the disagreement about what being a Christian entails, you know. So it's a verbal disagreement. Okay. So any questions? Now we have uh, discussed types of discourses, and then we have seen types of disagreements. Now when we end this class, I'm going to upload the video to your the resources folder of your Sakai so that um, you, and then I, I will uh, see if your course rep can have it so that you can, you can, um, you can have it on your WhatsApp platform as well. Okay, so any questions before we close? Robert has his hands with Cephas. Cephas and uh, Prince. So we'll begin with Cephas. Yeah, Cephas, you can go ahead. You need to unmute okay. your mic. Um, yeah. Please, can we get one example of the um, real disagreement, real disputes. Well, we gave you one, unless you had them joined when you you saw it. Okay. <clears throat> the okay. dispute about whether Accra should be the capital of Ghana or not is a disagreement about values. And then your normal disagreements about who should be the next president of the country is a value disagreement. <coughs> it is a difference in preferences, which also arise from different values. Okay, and then Prince. Prince, do you, do you have a question, Prince? Yes, yes, yes. So please, I'm finding difficult to understand the differences between the claim and the premises. Between what and what? Claims, the claims and the premises. Premises and claims. Well, I can't explain that to you. I can't explain claims. You need to find out the meaning of claims and find out the meaning of premises, find out the meaning of conclusion, look at the three of them and see how claim relates to uh, to, to each of them, you know. <coughs> Bright. So please, I don't really get the difference between the real and the verbal. <coughs> yeah, so the verbal, the verbal arises from confusion about the meaning of a word. And then the real disagreement is usually about either facts or values. Disagreements over facts or values, but not about the meaning of anything. So this is, um, let's say we've come to the end of the class and I'm going to have to stop the recording and start uploading it to your resources. So I hope that in a few minutes you'll be able to watch the video and then tell all latecomers and absentees to 
take advantage of uh, the video. So now let me proceed to uh, stop sharing and to stop the recording.